working of the Spirit's power. And we give you thanks and praise and offer ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love Pentecost. I love, I love Pentecost. I love the colors. But especially since 14 years ago, and I would say I had deeper experience of the Spirit, it finally it dawned on me in terms of the power and the importance of Pentecost and the work of the Holy Spirit. So I was, I was a couple weeks ago, I was wondering, oh, what am I going to preach this, you know, two weeks after Pastor Karen preaches, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me, it's Pentecost. And I suddenly got all jazzed because I, I love preaching on Pentecost. I love the power of the Holy Spirit, what the Spirit does. And so uh, this morning I want us to look, look at Pentecost and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to use the normal text. The, uh, the lectionary text is either Acts chapter 2, and that's the story uh, that Nick did in the monologue. He did a great job in the monologue. But you already heard the story. And alternative text is Romans 8, which is really one of the kind of the premier texts in, all, in the New Testament that talks about the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to just kind of go through the text uh, again. So in, in Romans, you know, Paul's making his argument, and in, in a way, Romans 8 is kind of the, the pinnacle of his understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. And when, in verse 9, it says, but you are not in the flesh. So in Pauline theology, the flesh doesn't mean physicality. The flesh is the word that talks about our sinful nature, the part of us that's re always in rebellion against God, the things that uh, cause us not to follow God. So when he, when, whenever you read in the New Testament uh, the word flesh, it's not denigrating physicality, the human body, or anything like that. It's a... It's a Pauline term, a theological term that refers to the rebellious nature, our, our human rebellious nature. So he says, but you're not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you. It's the spirit that gives life. The spirit is the source of life. It was the spirit that was brooding over the waters in the book of Genesis. The spirit is God's creative power. And wherever there is life, the Spirit of God is active and working and powerful. And so, if we belong to Christ, as Paul is saying, then Christ lives in us, and He lives in us through the Spirit. He gives us life. And not only that, as Paul says, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit uh, is life because of righteousness, if the Spirit who, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. So in the very same way that the Spirit raised Jesus, so again, that's our promised future hope that we too will be raised. And it will be the power of God through the working of the third person of the Trinity, the power of the Holy Spirit who gives life goes on, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I mean, this is an incredible statement. So if we have Christ, we are adopted into God's family. We become God's children. And not only do we become God's children, but we then are able to refer to God in the same way that Jesus referred to God. 
using that intimate word, that word of endearment, Abba. When Jesus prayed, he would say, Abba, Father, a term of endearment, a term that implies intimacy. And so as we come to Christ and the Spirit then lives in us, and I love it earlier on when it says, the Spirit is life. The Spirit is life, and the Spirit gives us life. The Spirit gives life to our faith. The Spirit is moving among us and in us. And so we are adopted then, and we have the privileges of this family, and we can even go to God and say, Abba, Abba, Father, the very same way that Jesus talked to his Father. What an incredible act that God has done in terms of sending out the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit then come upon us. And so, so we have this incredible gift. We have the power of God residing in us individually and, of course, within the church to give life. The Spirit is life. The Spirit gives life. And one of the first things we need to understand about the Spirit in this third person of the Trinity, the Spirit does not glorify Himself. The Spirit, the purpose of the Spirit is to glorify Christ and to make Christ's work and life effective in our own lives. Thomas Smale, who is a Pentecostal pastor and a theologian, writes, the Holy Spirit's function is to reflect in us the likeness of Christ, of His truth and love and power. But how could He do that with any authenticity or completeness if He did not also lead us into the likeness of His suffering? There could be no real reflection of Christ that did not consist of bearing His cross. And so the whole purpose of the Spirit as He adopts us, as we're adopted into God's family, is to work in our lives to make us more fully, more Christ-like, the children that God has called us to become. God loves us, but He loves us too much to let us stay the way we are when we come to faith in Christ. We are all on a journey of becoming Christ-like, which is totally impossible without the work of the Holy Spirit. No Holy Spirit, and we have no opportunity or no chance that our lives can be transformed into more Christ-likeness. And so the Spirit glorifies Christ and makes us, moves and molds us so that we can be more Christ-like. And he does it individually, and he does it within the body of the church. It was that first Pentecost, it wasn't one person. It was those small gathering of followers of Jesus who were gathered in the upper room. And in terms of the flames coming down upon them, the wind blowing, the flames coming about, it was a community that received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the community of Jesus is the place where the Holy Spirit resides. And it involves both the individual and the church. It's together. So worship, being a community in faith, serving one another, is so, so important in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now sometimes the understanding of the Holy Spirit can be really abused. I think on some Pentecostal churches, the, the emphasis is put on glamorous works of the Spirit. That was one of the problems in the church of Corinth. If you read the letters of Paul to the Corinthian church, they had some of the gifts of the Spirit, but they were bragging about the gifts of the Spirit. They totally lost view of the purpose of the gifts. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts so that we can build up the body of Christ. We can build up one another. It's not to glorify the Holy Spirit. It's not to glorify ourselves. It's not to say, well, I speak in tongues, or I have the gift of this, or I do that, or I do that. That is totally to miss the point and misunderstand the Spirit. And so, sometimes the Holy Spirit does some pretty dramatic things, like that first day of Pentecost. 
But I would say that's the, that's the exception, not the norm. On the other hand, there are other, other churches, many churches, for which the Holy Spirit is kind of like a placeholder for something, and you open it up and there's nothing in it. We talk about the Holy Spirit, but people either don't know what that really means, or it means nothing, but it's kind of a, a church term that you know you're supposed to use. Well, the Spirit must be here or do that. And that's also very, really not helpful. And so we have to have an understanding that God sends His Spirit. We can only grow. The Christian faith begins with God. It continues with God. It ends with God. We can't even come to faith without the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit prepares our heart. It's always the Spirit doing the works. And we are invited then to participate in the works of God through the power of the Spirit. We do not control the Spirit. We cannot control the Spirit. We can only prepare ourselves in ways so that the Spirit then can use the work that we've done to build Christ's likeness and to glorify Christ in the world. I don't want to cough, so I'm going to just be real careful here. And so the Spirit is powerful. I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of a couple of uh, different analogies. Any of you that are writers are serious writers, of which I am not. But I've, I've read different writers that said one of the most important things, even the most gifted writers, one of the most important things they need to do is every day they need to show up and they need to write. I've you know, heard many different authors, and they can do it at different times of the day, but they have to have a block of time, and if they're going to write anything that's worth anything, they have to do it day in and day out, and they kind of wait. They, they, one of the common uh, things they say is you have to wait for the muse to strike. But they say if you're not writing every single day, the muse isn't going to strike. And so... Uh, so that's, in, there's another way, you, you can use the sailing, you can use the sailing uh, analogy. Uh, the, the spirit is the wind, and if you're a good sailor, you can't make the wind come. All you can do is make sure the sails are, are up, everything is ready to go, so when that first puff comes, you're ready to sail. If you don't have the sails in the proper places, you don't have the jib. You don't. If things are not right, when the wind comes up, the, the sail is just going to luff. You're going to go nowhere. So there's a way in which we don't create the spirit. It's all from God, but we do have a part in it, and that is preparing ourselves. So when the spirit blows, we have done the things that we need to do. I guess the third analogy I think of is my own uh, horseback riding experience. I'm trying to learn to jump. You know the thing about jumping horses? Have you ever looked on TV? It looks so darn easy. I look at people jumping, and it looks so easy. And then there's just a little one-and-a-half-foot wall, and I'm coming like this. And the problem is, the thing that my teacher is always telling me, she says, Phil, the horse jumps. You don't jump. The rider is responsible for the line. You have to line, the balance, and energy. You have to kind of make sure the horse is going fast enough. But the horse jumps. Now, my horse is a good jumper, but if uh, horses are incredibly sensitive to their riders. So as we approach the fence, and I'm starting to really tighten up and not breathe, I send that message to the horse, and my horse can make an incredibly fast stop in front of the fence. <laughs> incredibly fast. And I've come off several times, and it's no fun. But I have to remember, I'm not jumping. It's the horse that's jumping. I just need to be holding on. I mean, I have to have proper form, but I just need to be holding on, and, the, and, the, and Brady will take me over beautifully. And so there's a way in which the Spirit wants to take us, but we, didn't do, we do need to do the preparation. And a lot of time, it's just, it's just doing the ordinary. I think most of the work the Holy Spirit does is in the ordinary things. You've heard me say over and over again, six marks of discipleship, practicing the, dis the spiritual disciplines. The reason we do that, it's because we're preparing ourselves 
to let the Holy Spirit use those things to build Christ's likeness in our life. It's in the ordinary things, the practices that we practice, that the Spirit uses. Now, sometimes the Spirit will do something dramatic, but it's the ordinary things that we practice that God will use through the Spirit to build faith into our lives, to build us into greater Christ-likeness. Now, I would say the other thing, when I think of Pentecost, uh, I think that one of the marks of Pentecost is joy. I've been to Africa enough, and I've been to enough, most of the time when I go to Africa, I go to Pentecostal churches. Uh, I've been to Catholic church, I've been to Baptist churches, I've been to Anglican church, but most of the people that I end up going with go to Pentecostal churches. I've been to kind of like very wealthy, pretty wealthy Pentecostal churches that have projection and everything. And I've been in, in very poor villages uh, where they didn't, all they had was a drum and something like a tambourine. And there was just dust and people, it was just sticks and a... Uh, posts and a uh, canvas canopy. But the one thing I have to say about the Pentecostal churches that I have gone to is there's always this joy. I've been to some church where I thought it was a show. I mean, some, and I'm not trying to lift up Pentecostal churches. Sin, there's all kind of sinful Pentecostal churches just like UCC and everyone else. But the one thing I really have found over and over again, there is this sense of joy. I remember one of the, one of the churches. I remember just very poor village, and, and I mean they have really not much at all, and the services are long. But boy, when you're in there, and the people are just joyful. They're singing. They're, there is this joy, and some of you that have traveled to Africa with me, I, I know have experienced that. And I remember thinking, what is this? Because I know these people are living hard, hard lives. They're living hand to mouth every day. And they come together and they draw joy in being together and worshiping God and just celebrating God. And so it seems to me that one of the marks of, uh, of the Spirit is joy. And even if you remember Pastor Karen's sermon last week when he was talking about the Philippian, uh, Paul and Silas in jail, in the Philippian jail, they were beaten, they were humiliated in the middle of the night. They're singing hymns and praying, and there's the earthquake that strikes. See, it, it's not, and that's why I had that, read that one quotation, it's not that the Spirit leads us away. It's not that the Spirit then says, well, now that uh, you're a follower of Jesus, you're not going to suffer. Uh-uh. It's even being able to be connected with Christ through the Spirit in a way that we can experience joy in suffering. Like Paul and Silas singing hymns at midnight in this terrible, under terrible conditions in this Philippian jail. And so, the Spirit gives life. Any life that we have as a congregation, it's because of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that, that gives life to our faith. It gives vitality and vibrancy to our fellowship. It ge it's the Spirit that lifts us up in worship. And so I praise God that God has sent the Spirit to be working in you and me. And I pray that we would be a people, no matter what we're going through, is that we experience joy.